The Peter Schiff Show. Well, here we go again. Janet Yellen was up on Capitol Hill and she was testifying about the banking system. And, you know, forget about all her comments about how solvent and how everything is in much better shape than it was, you know, before the financial crisis, because, of course, it's not. I think the banking system is more highly leveraged and more vulnerable uh, to increasing interest rates. All the too big to fail banks that we bailed out are now much bigger than they were before the bailout. And so they now represent an even bigger systemic threat that they did in the past. Forget about all that. I just want to focus on what she did or did not say about the Fed's intention to raise interest rates in December and how the market reacted to what she said or did not say. All the headlines following this uh, testimony were about how Janet Yellen is now going to raise rates in December. It's a live meeting. She put a rate hike on the table. The official probability of a December rate hike rose to 60% after she spoke from 50% before, as if somehow what she said moved us closer to the possibility of a rate hike. And of course, that probability was much lower. I think it was closer to 30% uh, prior to the Fed not hiking rates in October. But when they didn't hike rates in October, what the Fed did is they changed the statement and they took out some of the language that referenced their concerns about international markets. And so because they were no longer as worried as they were before, the interpretation was, oh, now the Fed is hawkish because since they're no longer worried about the global economy, well, now they can raise rates because that's the reason they didn't raise rates in October. That's not the reason they didn't raise rates in October. They had no intention of raising rates in October, just like they had no intention of raising them in September. Yes, they used the global economy as the excuse du jour, but if it wasn't that, it would have been something else. You know, because the last thing the Fed is going to do is admit the truth and say why it's not raising rates. So it used that excuse. And in December, when it doesn't raise rates, they'll use another excuse. Right. But the markets still believe that the Fed is about to raise rates. And so when they were not expressing those concerns the way they did the prior month, the interpretation was they're ready to go. Not 100 percent. Right. They moved it up to 50 percent. And now, based on what she supposedly said today, the odds are 60 percent. And of course, as soon as she said what everybody thinks she said, which she didn't, the dollar took off. Gold tanked. You know, gold is now down almost back down to 1100. It was almost at 1190 before the Fed didn't raise rates in October. The euro's all the way back down to 106 and a half. Where were we? 112, 114 uh, when the Fed didn't raise rates in October. And remember, there were still people who thought they might raise rates in October and they didn't do it. Uh, but now everybody thinks they're going to do it in December. But let's actually look at what Janet Yellen said, because nobody actually does that. First, I'm going to read from a Reuters story. And the headline is Feds Yellen sees possible December rate rise. And of course, possible, right? A possible rate rise. But that's all it takes, right? Just the possibility. Everybody jumps to the conclusion that it's going to happen. But here is what Janet Yellen said. These are her exact words. I'm reading them from the article and the article has it in quotation. What the committee has been expecting is that the economy will continue to grow at a pace that is sufficient to generate further improvements in the labor market and to return inflation to our 2% target over the medium term. That is what they have been expecting. Now, that hasn't happened. They've been expecting it all year, and it hasn't happened, right? They're still expecting it. Here's the rest of the quote. If the incoming information supports that expectation, then our statement indicates that December would be a live possibility. So here's what she's saying. If we are correct and we get what we have been expecting, right, which is a further improvement in the labor market and a increase in inflation, right, closer to our 2% target, if we get that, right, and they haven't gotten it. In fact, the labor market has been weakening, right? The labor force participation rate is now at a new low, right? Uh, wages have been stagnant. And the last two uh, jobs numbers were quite weak. So the Fed has actually been moving further from its goal. But what the Fed is saying here, what Yellen is saying, 
if we get the improvements that thus far we haven't gotten. Because remember, they haven't raised rates yet because they haven't got those improvements. And so what Janet Yellen is saying is if, by chance, we get those improvements between now and the December meeting, it is possible that we will raise rates. Not that it is probable, that it's possible. I mean, A, she could have said we will raise rates. She could have said if we get the improvements that we expect, we will raise rates. Or if we get the improvements that we expect, it's probable that we would raise rates, right? Will is a certainty. Probable means better than a 50-50 chance, right? We're more likely than not. But possible to say that a rate hike is a possibility? I mean, anything is possible, right? Long shots are possibilities, right? I mean, so even if it's a remote possibility, it's still a possibility. And again, in order for it to be a possibility, first, we have to see an improvement in the labor market, improvements that so far we haven't seen. Because the Fed didn't raise rates in September, it didn't raise them in June, it didn't raise them in March, because apparently we hadn't got enough improvements. But what the Fed is saying now is, first, we need to get those improvements. And if we do, it's possible, there is a possibility that we might raise rates in December. Well, again, anything is possible. I guess it's a possibility that Janet Yellen could have a sex change operation between now and December, right? I mean, it's possible, but it's probably not likely that she's going to have it, but it's possible. I mean, maybe she'll have a sex change operation and raise interest rates. That's possible too, right? But it's more probable that she is going to do neither. That is what's going to happen. In fact, if you actually interpret what Janet Yellen said, right, based on what I just read, what she actually said, what she said is it's a long shot that we're going to raise rates in December. She basically said, look, we're probably not going to do it, but it's a remote possibility that we might. That's really what she said. Because A, we got we have to have these further improvements in the labor market that we've been expecting all year, but we haven't gotten them. Uh, we haven't gotten these improvements that we've been expecting, but you never know. It's possible that we'll get the improvements in the next month and a half. And if we get them, maybe we'll raise rates. It's a possibility. Again, sure. So this is all she says. The dollar soars. Gold tanks. Yellen says she's going to raise rates. Yellen puts a rate hike on the table. It's a live meeting. It's possible. She's been saying this all year. And it hasn't meant anything. But one thing that Reuters left out of their article is right after Janet Yellen finished saying that December would be a live possibility. She quickly followed up by saying, I need to reiterate, of course, that at this point we haven't made up our mind. So the minute she said it was a live possibility, she wanted to go out of her way to say, look, I don't, we don't know, right? So don't take this to mean we're going to raise rates. We're just saying it's a possibility, but we still haven't made up our mind, so we have no idea what we're going to do. Look, here is a, another story from uh, CNBC. Title of the story, Janet Yellen, December rate hike, a live possibility. Yes, it is a live possibility, a very remote possibility, right? That's what it is, but they don't want to say that. Here's the quote uh, from Janet Yellen in this uh, article from CNBC. Here, quote, now, no decision has been made on that end, right? This is in response to a question about the live possibility. No decision has been made on that end. That means we haven't made a decision yet whether or not we're going to raise rates, right? So right now, apparently the Fed has no idea what they're going to do in December. No decision has been made on that. And what it will depend on is the Federal Open Market Committee's assessment at the time, so we have no idea if we're going to raise rates in December. We'll decide in December. So the Fed has got rates at zero for all these years, and somehow they're going to decide on the day what they're going to do. What are they going to flip a coin? Heads we raise, tails we don't. How are they going to decide on the spur of the moment? Let me finish the quote. That assessment will be informed by all the data that we collect between now and then. So in other words, we have no idea if we're going to raise rates, but we're going to collect a bunch of data between now and December, and then we're going to make a decision in December based on that data, whether or not we're going to raise rates. Yeah, right. There is no way, right, if the Fed doesn't know by now that they're going to raise rates in December next month, if they don't know that, they're not going to do it. How could they not know? 
How different can the data be in the next five or six weeks from all the data that's been coming out all year and they haven't raised rates? Most likely it's going to be more of the same. So nothing's going to change. And of course, if nothing's going to change, why not just make a decision? Why don't they say, hey, we decided to raise rates in December. We didn't want to raise them in October. We're going to do it. They don't say that. All they're saying is the same thing they've been saying all year round, and yet everybody is fooled. CNBC is fooled. Reuters is fooled. All the traders are fooled. This is Janet Yellen's plan, right? And apparently it's pretty clever. I mean, it's clever enough to fool all these people. It's not clever enough to fool me. You know, I guess the bar is pretty low when it comes to the mainstream uh, media or the financial community, Wall Street. I mean, they're pretty easily fooled. But here's what Janet Yellen is doing. And I've said this before. Janet Yellen's monetary policy is to pretend she's going to raise rates, but then not do it. Keep pretending that the economy is strong enough to support a rate hike, but then, you know, not raise rates, but keep the possibility alive. Keep people thinking that that she is about to do it, but then not do it. And in fact, I've heard people say, well, if the Fed doesn't raise rates by December, well, then look, they've lo- lost all their credibility, but they've never promised to do it. If they don't raise rates, Janet Yellen can always say, what are you talking about? We never said we were going to raise rates. We just said it was possible. That's all we said. We said it was possible that we could raise rates. It was also possible that we wouldn't raise rates. And in fact, if you actually listen to what she's saying, it's far more probable that she won't raise rates. Because before which she would raise rates, first you have to see an improvement in the data, which thus far we have not seen, because if we saw it, she would have already raised rates. So before the decision to raise rates can even happen, A, we've got to see these improvements. And then if we see the improvements, then the Fed has to decide that they want to raise rates, but they might not. I mean, it's possible based on what Janet Yellen says that she can see the improvements in the labor market. She can see the quote unquote improvement in the inflation outlook, meaning higher inflation. And the Fed might still decide not to raise rates because she didn't commit to doing anything. Yet somehow the media interprets it. And here's the one thing that Janet Yellen isn't doing, right? Because if you actually listen to what she's saying, right, she says, we're probably not going to raise rates. I mean, there's a remote possibility that we will, but, you know, we're probably not. That's really what she's saying. Now she sees the media reacting to what she said. Wall Street, ah, Fed's about to raise rates. She does nothing to alter that false perception. She kind of validates it with her silence because the, the media and everybody else is misinterpreting what her statement is. And the fact is, that's what she wants. That's her cover. She's not doing anything, so she still has an out, right? Her out is that I never said I was going to raise rates. I can't help it if the markets are jumping to the wrong conclusion. I never said that. We don't. What did I say? I just said it was a possibility. And, you know, I don't know where you guys got this inevitability or where you got that it was a high possibility or even a probability. I said a possibility, right? It's possible that I got the winning lottery ticket, right? You know, anything is possible. And that's all she's ever said. But this shows to me that this is by design. The fact that she is not going out of her way. Nobody is going out of their way to dampen these false expectations because this is what they want. This is how they're tightening. They're tightening by their rhetoric, by talking about raising rates. That's their tightening. I mean, that's basically all we could do because uh, you can't actually raise rates because the economy is so weak. In fact, a, a story that came out today about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac Freddie Mac just posted its first quarterly loss in four years. They lost in the third quarter $475 million. Now, here's why this is so significant. Freddie Mac has been making profits every quarter, and they've been paying those profits to the U.S. Treasury. And that has been reducing the deficit because they get that income that they wouldn't have got. And that's like tax revenue. And so because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been profitable— Right. That's been, you know, helping out the Treasury. That's been lowering the deficit. But of course, how have they been profitable by making loans to uh, subprime borrowers with three percent down where they're not going to get paid back? Right. They're taking a lot of risk. And in exchange, in the short run, they're making some profits. But we know how this is going to end because we've already seen this movie. Right. And so now they just posted a quarterly loss of four hundred seventy five million dollars. And that means instead of giving the government a check, They're going to prevent the government with a bill. And now the government's going to have to pay that loss. That's a bailout. And this is just getting started. And think about this. They're now losing money with interest rates still at zero. 
how much more money are they going to lose if the Fed raises rates? They're going to lose not only not millions, billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars will be the losses if uh, the Fed is going to raise rates. So how are they going to do that? They're not right. That the now again, am I saying it is impossible that the Fed will raise rates in December? No. I just think it is a low possibility event. I think it is highly improbable that they will do it. What's far more likely is they will continue to punt. They will continue not to raise rates, but pretend that they will. Because so far, it's working like a charm, right? They're having their cake and eating it too. They get the best of both worlds. Everybody believes they're going to raise rates. Everybody believes the economy is strong. And they don't actually have to raise rates and crush the economy and prove it's not strong. They don't have to, they don't have to prick their bubble. I mean, look at uh, the economic data that has come out this week. I mean, it's not strong. Everybody ignores it. I mean, some of the data beat estimates, but most of it missed. Probably one of the biggest misses and most important ones was yesterday's factory orders. We got the factory orders number. They're now down year over year for, uh, I think, 11 consecutive months. This only happens during a recession. It's almost an entire year where you have year over year declines. They were looking for a decline of 0.9, which was a bad number. We got a decline of 1%. But from a downwardly revised uh, August, the original factory order for August on the month was down 1.7%. We actually got down 2.1%. So the down 1% was on top of a larger decline in the prior month. So all of this, by the way, is going to take away from the third quarter GDP that just came out that was already below estimates. So that's going to come down. Now, of course, the big number is going to be the uh, non-farm payroll number that comes out on Friday. But we did get the ADP number that came out today. And this was slightly below estimates. The consensus was 185. And it came in below that at 182. Uh, Last month was 200,000, the original report. They revised that down to 190. Uh, So, you know, there's the job picture is a little bit, you know, less robust or these are these are less numbers or weaker numbers than we had before or less strong and of course you know if you look beneath the surface we lost manufacturing jobs according to adp we gained service sector jobs but this is part of the problem right we lose these good jobs that have high pay good benefits you can support a family on these jobs right those are the jobs we lose and the jobs that we gain are these service sector minimum wage jobs part-time jobs, right? The kind of jobs that you can't support anything on, right? You're you're living at home with your parents. You know, those are the kind of jobs that we are creating. And so there's no indication that we're getting any kind of improvement along the lines that theoretically Janet Yellen would want to see in the labor market, which is more participation, fewer part-time jobs, more high-paying jobs. None of that is happening. We're getting further and further away from the Fed's goal while everybody is pretending that they're about to raise rates. Now, I want to make an announcement regarding my father's book, The Biggest Con, which many of you have been purchasing. And it's a great book. And, you know, it was very influential uh, in my understanding of economics. I read it initially as a kid, but I've read it several times uh, since then over my life. And, you know, whenever I read that book, I actually hear my father's voice, the sound of his voice. It's almost like he's speaking to me. And I'm sure I'll be reading it uh, several more times uh, over the course of my my life. Now that my father is gone, it's probably even more important that I hear that voice, even if it's only in my in my mind. But of course, there are videos. I put some videos of my father. Many of you have watched on my YouTube channel the uh, debate that he did at the Libertarian Convention 1996 when he ran for president. I put up on my YouTube channel a speech that he gave two weeks after the 9-11 tragedy in 2001. If you haven't listened, uh, watched these uh, YouTube videos, I would strongly suggest you have a listen to what my dad had to say. But on the book, The Biggest Con, we've sold out. I have no more copies. I have a couple left, but those are my personal copies. I mean, I have to keep some copies. I actually have a couple of copies of the original hardcover. Uh, but that's it. I certainly can't part with those. I can't sell them because those are the only copies I have. I think I only have two of them. I mean, they do have some that they sell probably uh, on online, but probably at much higher prices than than what I was selling them for. Uh, but they're they're gone. Uh, what I do have, I still have plenty of copies of the uh, the Kingdom of Malts, which is a great little book, and I still recommend if you don't have a copy 
pick up a copy. I'm still autographing them. So anybody who's buying my dad's books, I am, you know, signing them Peter Schiff uh, for what that's worth. But what I do have is, I think, 98 copies of the Great Income Tax Hoax. Now, I have the paperbacks. I don't have the original hardcover. And the original hardcover actually had me as the co-author. I was credited as the co-author. I didn't actually write any of the book, but I was living with my dad when he was doing it, and he would send me to the Harvard uh, Law Library. And I did a lot of the research. Or I didn't do the research. He would send me there to get certain cases and shepherdize other cases, and I would go and I would get some cases and I would photocopy it, and I, you know, I'd bring it back. You know, It wasn't like we could just use the internet back then like you can today. So I was really going back and forth to the law library uh, to get my dad the information that he needed uh, and this book, The Great Income Tax Hoax, is full of analysis of court cases. I mean, it really is, I think, the definitive work. Nobody has analyzed the history of the income tax, and it's really the history of direct taxation in the United States going back uh, to the beginning of the Republic. And my father goes back, and not only the Constitution, but the Ed Elliott debates, the Federalist Papers. He really educates you to understand the, how this U.S. government was supposed to function, the difference between direct taxes, excise taxes, and he goes into the income tax uh, in the Civil War, the income tax uh, that was declared unconstitutional in 1896, the 13th Amendment, all this stuff. It's a great history that you're not going to get in your standard uh, textbook in constitutional law or legal uh, a book about taxation and, and the income tax or the Constitution. It's a great, great book. And I got 96 copies, and I've, I'm going to sell them for $30 a piece, the same price I was selling the, the biggest con for. And while supplies last, you can buy it. Just one caveat, the subtitle on that book is, you know, how you can immediately stop paying the tax, right? So my father does, as all of his tax books, he has advice and recommendations about how to not pay your income tax. And of course, you know, my father died uh, serving a 13, 14 year prison sentence, and he was in jail twice before. So while the book does contain some information about how not to pay your income taxes along the lines that my father didn't pay his income taxes, I am not encouraging, in fact, I am discouraging anybody from actually following that advice. If you want to, if you want to risk uh, going to jail, if you want to risk the government seizing your money, illegally, of course, because I do believe that my father was technically right on, on, on most of what he's saying. But where my father was wrong is he always believed that he would prevail just because he had the law on his side. Well, that was not true. This is America, right? This is a nation of men, not of laws. And it's very corrupt. And I understand that. And I recognize the futility of trying to go against this machine. Right. I mean, talk about don't fight City Hall. I mean, this is City Hall on steroids. So I'm not urging anybody or encouraging that anybody pick up my father's fight. I mean, he fought that fight and he was willing to do it. And if somebody is willing to do it and they want to do it, I mean, fine. But that is not my advice. So I'm recommending you want to buy this book. It's not a how to book as far as I'm concerned on how to not pay income taxes. Buy it because it's a great education. It is entertaining. And you will understand my father's arguments. You will understand the basis upon which he decided not to pay income taxes if you read this book. And so that's why I'm making it available. And that's all I have. Those are the only copies that I have in my possession. I mean, I'm going to keep a couple uh, for myself, but that's going to be it. And so they're for sale now. I don't expect them to last very long. In fact, the reason I wanted to mention it at the end of this podcast and not at the beginning is I want the people to listen to the whole podcast to be able to buy it, right? Because I know that we're going to run out uh, very quickly because I don't have that many, that many copies. So it's the great income tax hoax. If you want to buy it, you go to shiftbooks.com, shiftbooks.com and, and pick up the great income tax hoax. What I will do as a special... If you, you know, if you want to get an extra copy of the Kingdom of Malts, because I have a lot of those, and if you want to get a copy of the Kingdom of Malts included with your, with your great income tax hoax, I'll sell that book for $15. We sell it by itself for $25. But if you want to buy a package, uh, one copy of the great income tax hoax and one copy of the Kingdom of Malts, you can get both for $45, and I will autograph them both. But that offer of $15 for the Kingdom of Malts 
is only good until I sell out of my my 96 or 98. I forget how many I've got copies of the great income tax hoax. So you can get a package deal, uh, two for 45, or if you want, just buy the great income tax hoax for $30 again. And then there's shipping and handling. I forget. It's all on the website, but just go to shiftbooks.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.